Hello everyone, I'm Chris Aitken, co-founder of MBA Prep School, and we appreciate you tuning in for this webinar, which is brought to you by our friends at GMAT Club. We're excited to take part in GMAT Club's 1 million posts event and congratulate them on this great milestone. Today we'll be talking about a number of ways that you can supercharge your MBA candidacy. The first part of this lecture by my co-founder Tyler Cormney will share ways you can strengthen your MBA candidacy in the months and years prior to starting the application process. In the second half, I will take over and share with you 25 ways you can supercharge all seven elements of your MBA application. Before we begin, I'd like to spend just a moment telling you a little bit about MBA Prep School. MBA Prep School is the only place where you can learn the approach admissions experts have developed to create outstanding MBA applications. We offer traditional admissions consulting services provided by experienced consultants who've graduated from top schools including Harvard Business School and Wharton. We also offer the web's first and only virtual admissions consulting program. In our virtual consulting series, admissions experts with a proven track record of getting clients into top business schools will teach you their secrets in over 35 on-demand lessons. Our series includes exercises, case studies and sample essays. It really is the next best thing to working with a private coach and yet costs a fraction of what hiring a private consultant will. Please stick around to the end of this lecture because we're going to offer you an unbeatable discount on our virtual consulting program. We hope you'll visit us at mbaprepschool.com to discover a proven way to apply for an MBA from a top business school and get in. I'm pleased now to introduce you to Tyler and tell you a little bit about his qualifications. Tyler started his admissions consulting career in 2006 with one of the leading firms in the field, and he's helped hundreds of applicants realize their dreams of attending a top-tier MBA program. In fact, last year, over 90% of his clients got into one or more of their top three schools. The two of us co-authored the book, How to Apply for an MBA, which is available both on Amazon.com and the MBA Prep School website. Tyler holds a Harvard MBA with distinction, a master's degree in professional writing from the University of Southern California, and is a graduate of the Honors Business Program at the University of Texas at Austin. Thanks, Chris, and a special thanks to the GMAT Club for inviting us to participate. In the first half of this webinar, my goal is to teach you to start thinking like an admissions officer so that you can identify the strengths and the weaknesses in your MBA candidacy before it's time to apply. Then I'm going to tell you how to take proactive steps to supercharge your applications that is, how to reinforce your strengths and overcome your weaknesses so that you can improve your chances of getting into a top MBA. Let's take a look at our lesson plan. In today's lecture, I'm going to show you how to assess your MBA candidacy in four distinct areas and help you to identify potential weaknesses in each area. Those areas include your academic profile, your career progress, your leadership portfolio, and your career goals. After helping you to uncover potential weaknesses within these categories, I'll tell you about ways you can proactively correct or counterbalance each potential flaw. As you'll see, some of the prescriptions I'm going to share with you can be accomplished in the months leading up to your application. Others are going to require more significant lead time, perhaps a year or more. So what we'll help you to do is build an action plan in light of the time that you've got remaining until your application deadlines. The first area we're going to discuss is your academic profile. Admissions officers are going to be looking at your academic performance and your standardized test scores to judge whether you have the smarts and the discipline and the drive to perform in a top MBA program. My first piece of advice is get a copy of your transcripts right away. Review it carefully with an eye to how that academic history might look to an admissions officer. You don't want to delay because you might find out too late and not have time to take advantage of some of the steps I'm going to talk about in the next slide to improve your academic profile. So what are the warning signs or red flags in this area? Of course, a low cumulative GPA or a GPA in your major is the significant hurdle to getting into a top MBA program. So what is a low GPA? For the most competitive schools, a cumulative GPA below about a 3.25 can put your academic ability into question. Now, while overall performance matters, a letter grade of C or lower is going to draw attention, especially if it's in a quantitative course such as calculus or statistics, or business courses like finance, accounting, and economics. 
Um, admissions officers also might be worried if they see low scores in communication courses, writing, composition, etc. Moving on to another area, your GMAT and your GRE scores are also part of your academic standing. So a score that's below the school's median is going to raise concerns. Also, if your verbal score or your quantitative score is below around the 80th percentile, you start to get in trouble with the top uh, tier MBA program admissions offices. If English isn't your first language and you didn't study at an English language university, then you might be required to take the TOEFL exam. TOEFL scores below the median for that school, for the schools you're applying to, could be another academic red flag. There's an area next that we'll talk about. It typically affects folks outside the U.S. where three-year bachelor degrees are more common um, in countries like India. Now, if you have a three-year bachelor's degree, you may actually be ineligible to apply to some MBA programs. Um, others will let you apply with a three-year bachelor's degree, but you'll be viewed, potentially viewed, as less competitive uh, to applicants that have the four-year degree or postgraduate studies um, plus the three-year degree. So finally, even if you have a stellar GPA, your academic profile won't be as strong if your school doesn't have a solid academic rep reputation. So let's, let's talk about some ways you can improve on your academic profile. The most straightforward way to enhance your academic profile is to complete additional college level or even postgraduate courses in the areas where you may have low grades. Earning an A from a reputable academic institution can counterbalance poor performance to close gaps in your transcripts. We sometimes call this your alternative transcript. So taking classes, part-time classes in statistics, finance, accounting, and scoring well can make your academic profile uh, much stronger. Now, if you didn't have strong grades in those courses, um, accounting, statistics, finance, calculus, I'm going to emphasize you need to take a course that is going to assign a letter grade because pass-fail courses can certainly show that you're motivated to address your weaknesses, but they're not going to be as strong. Uh, you can't use it as evidence that you're going to be able to uh, perform in the MBA classroom unless you have earned a grade that you can present as part of your optional essay or as, as part of your application package. Speaking of test scores, if your test scores are below the median or if you've got that you know, if you're below 80% in maybe the verbal or the quantitative section of the GMAT, prescription is pretty straightforward. You retake the exam. And I, I'm often asked, you know, how many times can you retake or should, should I retake the, the GMAT exam? The truth is most schools are only going to ask for your highest score. And for those programs, there's no penalty for retaking the exam and, and, and earning, you know, until such time as you actually beat the median. Um, now, Every candidate, of course, is going to benefit from a high GMAT score, but these standardized test scores are even more important if you need to combat red flags in your, in your transcripts. So I highly encourage you to, to retake that exam if you don't have the score you need to be competitive. And if you're really struggling, think about hiring a tutor. Another way to, cons to address concerns about your academic profile is through high achievement in work or, or even outside of work on assignments that that demand that particular academic skill set. So you could perhaps you could demonstrate your analytical abilities. If your analytical abilities were weak in your transcripts, you could demonstrate that you have those abilities by performing really well on the job or in a uh, you know, community service assignment where you're uh, asked to draw up those uh, analytical abilities. If, um, if you fall into that category, your bachelor's degree, then in some cases you may need to take a fourth year or even continue on for a master's degree uh, to uh, supplement your studies. Now, one thing also, even if you do have a four-year uh, degree but your academic transcripts um, are weak, postgraduate study can also be a way that you can address uh, or I guess provide evidence to the admissions office that you now have the study habits and of course the aptitude to perform in an academic setting. So postgrad studies could be a, a way to counterbalance um, the uh, you know the, the weak uh, university transcripts. Now, finally, uh, I've seen cases where earning a professional de designation like the CPA or the CFA can address any concerns or red flags in those analytical abilities or in your maybe your your performance in a finance or accounting course back in college. It, it's also um, you know it also adds strengths to your overall candidacy. So that's the academic area. Now let's talk about your career progress next. 
long before you apply, you want to be thinking about your career progress and thinking about how strong your career story might sound to the admissions committee. So let's look at some areas of concern in the career progress aspect of your profile. But, but more, more importantly, what I want you to, to think about is, even if you're going to be applying just in a few months, think about every day as an opportunity to add a new story or even a, a new chapter to your career story. Now, what are admissions officers going to be concerned about when considering your resume? Uh, you know, look at your resume through their eyes. First of all, admissions officers are going to be looking for evidence that you've made significant career progress, right? That's no surprise. But, but what does that mean? That means promotions ahead of schedule, um, increases in responsibility, being entrusted with, uh, with co complex and important projects at work. Um, have you acquired new skills? Have you built relationships? All of those things are important to career uh, are important uh, signals of your career progress. Now, the best kind of progress you might say is progress in the direction of your career goals. So, if you haven't made any significant steps towards the career goals that you plan to write about in your application essays, you're going to need to implement some of the prescriptions that I'm going to tell you about in the next slide. Now. A third way that schools measure career progress is by reading your reference letters, so the letters from your superiors. So take a moment right now and consider how strong do you think your reference letters are going to be? Do you have people that are going to go to bat for you? Have you really delivered for your boss? Um, all of those things are, are going to be important because weak references can really sink your applications. And, and one last note of career progress, candidates who ha have made progress but uh, have, made, have done so in a, in a very technical field aren't always accepted by the top uh, MBA programs. And the reason is they haven't had a chance to demonstrate their, their managerial potential. So I'll offer some specific prescriptions for candidates who are in those technical fields in, in just a moment. Now, the advice that I'm about to give you is, is just good career advice, whether you're going to apply for an MBA or not. Now, of course, if you take this advice to heart, if you take action on some of the things I'm going to recommend, you're going to be making uh, progress towards an acceptance letter at a top tier MBA program as well. So if career progress is going to be a concern in your application, let's, let's start with the most radical prescription first, which as you might imagine is changing jobs. Now um, if, you, if you're more than 18 months away from applying for an MBA, you can, you can think about whether changing jobs or companies or even your career path as a whole is the best way to improve your career progress. Now, when does, make, when, when does making jobs, or sorry, changing jobs make sense? It makes sense when it's really best for your future career goals and your career as a whole. So, you know, if your learning curve is flatlined, if you just aren't getting opportunities to enhance your, your management and leadership skills and other business skills at your job, if those things just aren't presenting themselves, then you should seriously start thinking about, you know, and considering a career change. I, I've definitely had uh, clients who, you know, that, that, that second job they took um, after undergraduate was the one that really provided the raw materials for a great MBA application and, and, and really was the best preparation for their MBA. So, you know, the, the bottom line is uh, if a career change is the best next step in your overall, you know, well-designed, well-conceived career action plan, then it's certainly the next best step in strengthening your MBA candidacy as well. Now, let's, let's go, uh, you know, let's go in the category, though, of, of making the best of your current situation. I mean, generally, that's that's almost always better than starting from scratch, right? So if your career has lost momentum, um, you know, you need to be proactive. Start volunteering for stretch assignments and unique projects. Start, start showing up at work and, and you know, uh, uh, start showing up for work and, and stepping up at work when uh, opportunities present themselves. Basically, you, you got to think about, you want those references of yours, your, your superiors, to have plenty of great examples to draw on uh, when they write those reference letters to show that you've excelled, that you've you've been there for your team. Now I'd like to address the folks that we mentioned in the prior slide, folks that have worked in a highly technical field. Maybe they've made great career progress in an area like software engineering, but haven't really had an opportunity to show their their management skills, their interpersonal abilities, their you know their leadership abilities. Now, if formal opportunities 
aren't presenting themselves, sometimes you need to get aggressive and sometimes you need to get creative. And that, that, can, that can mean taking the initiative to propose a project that you can lead. Um, in other cases, I've even had clients who didn't have an opportunity to lead at work, but they started businesses on the side. And those businesses that they worked on on the side have, have been great examples of their ability to lead a team, to think like a manager, to solve business problems. The point is, if, if you're in a technical field, but you're serious about going to a top business school, you've got to be scanning the horizon for every opportunity to show the admissions committee that you're, you're more than a gearhead, you're, you're more than a quant jock or even a rocket scientist. You, you've got to show them that you're a future business leader. Now, my final piece of advice for accelerating your career progress is to develop and cultivate your mentor relationships and, and to model those successful p- superiors. We, you know, we talked about uh, re- you know, reference letters. Uh, strong reference letters are an incredibly important uh, aspect of supercharging your MBA application. So you know, this is in large part common sense career advice, but getting those mentors, um, seeking out help in, from them in, in navigating your important career decisions, is uh, you know, building those relationships is going to be incredibly valuable when it comes time to ask them to uh, back you up and, and write your reference letters. Now, forming those great re- mentor relationships, they just don't, they don't happen over, overnight. And that, you know, that's why the, this, is a, this is one of those, those tips that you're going to have to be thinking about you know, long before you apply. Because there's, there's a big difference between cultivating a mentor relationship over time, building that relationship and investing in that relationship. Uh, there's a big difference between that and trying to manufacture a mentor relationship uh, you know, a couple months before you apply. Now, in the same way that I suggested that it's time to evaluate your career progress, you know, and, and that I want you to do so months or e- you know even a year or more before you apply, is um, you know f- improving and, and 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 addressing these weaknesses takes time, and, and that's true of this next area we're going to talk about too, which is uh, you know taking a look at your leadership leadership portfolio. Um, and, uh, you know, and then of course we'll talk about what to do if your leadership portfolio is, is lightweight at the moment. So I use this term leadership portfolio. I just mean the collection of experiences and initiatives and accomplishments that are indicative, that provide uh, evidence of your leadership potential. Now, at, at this stage, you know, some, some candidates are really nervous had a chance to lead they don't they don't think but you know leadership on any scale is is going to be considered um, by the the adcom you know so that might include leading a classroom right or a, a training session at work or you know if you're in the military uh, directing you know a, a small squad or you know, taking on an important uh, initiative uh, you know that your boss needs help on. I mean, even I've had a client write a great essay about coaching a little league baseball team. You know, interacting with the parents and <laughs> managing those difficult relationships, as well as you know, motivating his his team. So you know, th- there's there's a lot of areas that you can draw upon to to uh, you know to to f- a lot of, a lot of areas you can feature in your leadership portfolio. Um, but you know, what what are some of the shortfalls? What are some of the concerns now? Admissions committees are going to be uh, concerned if uh, you know if the if the content just isn't there. If your port- leadership portfolio is lightweight, um, if if you haven't shown that you can rally the troops, you know, and and motivate them, then your chances of getting into a top MBA are going to are, are you know, really will really drop significantly. Now, the other problem is if you haven't had any leadership experiences, you probably don't know what your leadership strengths are or or you know what your leadership style is. You you might not even know what your leadership development needs might be because you haven't had them tested. And you know that that awareness, you know that lack of insight about your personal leadership style or your leadership de- development needs is a red flag. And and then finally, you know, not all leadership styles are going to be valued equally. Um, admissions committees can be turned off if it looks like you know, in, in your reference letters or in your essays or in your resume, if you've been authoritarian or even worse, uh, self-serving when it comes to being a leader. So, so we really talk, we talk about the servant leadership model. And this, is, this, this type of leadership, this leadership style is more highly prized by the admissions committee than the authoritarian, you know, or hierarchical style. Servant leadership means that you're placing the organization's mission or the team's goals uh, first, right? Um, and you're 
needs come uh, second or, or maybe even a distant third. This is this style is really the opposite of that leader who's trying to accumulate power or influence for its own sake, or or trying to you know clamp down and exercise uh, undue control over the situation. So, so let's talk about some steps you can take to enhance your leadership portfolio and supercharge your MBA application in this area. Now, this is a long you know this is a long game here, folks. So we're talking years, uh, maybe months at least in, in terms of taking, you know, taking on some of these prescriptions. You, can, you can't do this at the last minute. But, but the, same, you know, the same idea uh, I talked about in career progress applies. You've got to be scanning the environment, looking for those opportunities to, to make, a, make a leadership impact. So you know, in terms of leadership um, impact at work, we're not talking about you know, jumping over uh, and stepping on people to climb up the corporate ladder. Really, we're talking about ways that you, you know, keeping, staying vigilant for ways to serve your team, make your organization stronger. So um, there's some confusion too. You know, what is leadership? I know that's a, we, we probably use that word a lot, but, but you know, I think it's helpful to, if, we, if we provide some examples. Now, you know, pulling a week of all-nighters you know, at work, alone in your cubicle, you know, developing that, that brilliant financial model right, that's going to you know, be part of a, a, a transaction you're working on in banking, that's, that's actually more of an individual accomplishment. But a leadership compliment, accomplishment, and this, is, this comes to being able to sort of think about what's in your leadership portfolio, a, a leadership co- accomplishment is one in which you, you, know, you see a problem and then you coordinate other people's efforts to solve that problem. Or, or maybe you see an opportunity, something creative or innovative, and uh, you know persuade other people to follow you in that new direction. Um, it could be simple things, just like getting people to work, you know, who weren't working together well, getting them to work together more effectively. Um, a leadership, uh, you know, a leadership story might be about assembling a team, um, you know, providing them with the resources and skills that they need, you know, building that high-performing team. And finally, you know, mentorship, t- teaching others. That's that's an important aspect of being a leader. You know, making sure that other people can succeed. So the common denominator in all of these is that a leadership accomplishment has to do with with achieving something that you just can't do on your own. It's it requires cooperation, contribution, support, energy of other people. Now, it, it's just very important. I wanted to spend some time on this because you know if you have this definition clearly in mind. Um, it's going to help you when you're evaluating ways to add to your leadership portfolio. You're going to know um, what uh, you know, what things, what you know, potential uh, activities and so forth will uh, add stories to your leadership portfolio. So, you know, if you're early in your career or the low person on the term pole in a hierarchical organization, as many MBA candidates are, you know, opportunities at work to be a leader are, are, are probably going to be limited. Now, if that's the case, that doesn't mean you sort of have a, a get out of jail free card here. Um, if, if that's the case, then I'm going to strongly encourage you, you uh, and we'll talk about how in the next next slide. But I strongly encourage you to 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 build on your leadership portfolio by getting involved outside of work. So you know, at this point, almost all applicants and be applicants know that community service is is practically a prerequisite for getting into a top business school, but I think I think many of them miss the point. It, it's not just it's not just participating in community service organizations. That that's not enough. Um, rather, you want to demonstrate a habit of leadership, and that habit should extend to making a difference for others uh, outside of the work setting. So, first of all, you know if you're thinking about getting involved in a community service organization, and I strongly encourage you to. Um, concentrate on the quality of the experience. That's so much more important than quantity, right? You know, one really significant leadership achievement and leadership story can outweigh a whole laundry list of, you know, more targeted and limited volunteer work. So, so keep that in mind, you know, focus, prioritize. You, you guys are going to be busy, so you may just have to choose one, one thing and do it really well than, ra- ra- rather than try to do a number of things, um, you know, only half as well. So... I'm often asked by uh, applicants who haven't done any volunteer work, what kinds of community service activities should I get involved with? What, what, what does the adcom want to see? Now, again, this, this misses the point that there's no community service organization that's better than another from an admissions officer standpoint. Admissions officers, they, they just want to see that you're engaged with the community, that you have a passion for serving, that you know, you've done some volunteer work that has meaning and importance to you. That, that's really what counts. Now, 
let's say, as has as, as been in the case for some clients I've worked with, um, you know, they couldn't find an organization that turned them on or, uh, you know, th- th- there was nothing in their immediate area that, that they wanted to get involved with. Well, you know, I told them, I, you know, I've, I've told, you know, folks in that situation, you know, look for an unmet need in your community, right? Um, start something. Now, if you're successful, you're going to have an amazing story, right? Founders, you know, founder type leaders establishing something new. That really is highly prized and it's a, you know, it's a great thing to have in your leadership portfolio. Now, if you're already volunteering for a community service organization, then you should be looking for the same kind of opportunities that I talked about when we spoke about exercising leadership at work, right? Opportunities to harness the energy of other people, generate results, make a difference. So, you know, that might, in, you know, that might involve taking on a fundraising uh, campaign or leading the, you know, the annual gala or building alliances with other, you know, groups and organizations that are going to make your community service organization stronger. You know, all those opportunities to lead uh, are, are, uh, and make a difference and make an impact, that's what admissions com- committees really want to see in your leadership portfolio. Now, one final word of advice, uh, you know, back to our, our candidates who are in those technical fields or, or let's say you're from an overrepresented industry um, like consulting or banking. And... Um, you know, it, it's very uh, often in these types of uh, these types of jobs, you don't have many opportunities to lead at work, as we talked about, and that's why community service leadership is, you know, is practically mandatory, right? You're in a competitive pool to begin with. How are you going to stand out? Well, uh, you know, really achieving something important outside of work and demonstrating that habit of leadership outside of work can be um, it can be key to supercharging those MBA applications. Now. The primary reason for pursuing a, a master's in business administration, let's face it, is to prepare yourself for your future career in business, your future career as a business leader. So you may have decided that you want an MBA. The question is, can you clearly articulate why you need an MBA and how the MBA is going to prepare you for your short-term and long-term career goals? Now, uh, in this last section of, of my portion of the webinar, we're going to talk about the importance of focused career goals when you're applying for an MBA. So with the application deadlines approaching, you know, when that happens for you, it's going to be very hard to to carve out any serious time to do career planning type stuff. So that means establishing and clarifying your career goals early um, when you do have the time will mean you're that that much ready, uh, that much more prepared to build a great MBA application when, uh, when those deadlines approach. So, so that means thinking about uh, your career action plan now. And so admissions committees are going to expect you to have focused career goals and, and, a, and, and really strong, you know, we'll call them cogent, cohesive reasons for, for pursuing an MBA. You're going to be asked about your career aspirations uh, and why you want an MBA, I- either in the application essays or, or certainly during the admissions interview. So let's talk about the kind of answers that uh, are going to undermine right your your application and 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 you know and 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 might even derail an otherwise solid candidacy. Now, when it comes to questions about your career goals, uh, saying I want to figure it out once I get to business school isn't sufficient. You know, I, I wish it was, but it's not. So, if you haven't determined what your career goals are, the question is, you know, the question an admissions officer is going to ask is, how do you know if an MBA is even your next best step? Um, you know, furthermore, your candidacy is not going to compare favorably with those applicants who do know where they want to go and, and can explain how the MBA is going to get there. So admissions officers know that once you're in business school, you're going to have more work to do you know, in your classes and in clubs and uh, you know, uh, you know, special conferences. Then there's going to be more things uh, you know, buying for your attention than there are hours in the day. And, and so that means there's not a lot of time for self-reflection and career planning when you get to, you know get to business school. So, the you know my my point is that if you don't already have your career planned out, you're you're not going to be able to ad- benefit as much for the MBA experience as the candidates who do. Right? They're going to have an action plan. They're going to know what club to join and what class to take and what professor to rub elbows with. And you're going to be you know trying to figure it out. So that's why, um, you know, that's why these, uh, these MBA admissions committees um, seem to have this unreasonable expectation that you're going to know what you want to do before you go to business school. Now, your career goals 
really, of course, relate directly, as we talked about, to your motivations for pursuing an MBA. So therefore, if you, you know, if you have thought about your career goals, uh, you're going to have a hard time answering the why MBA question in anything other than kind of very general, broad, generic terms. So, you know, um, that, that, that's the other reason that, you know, it's very important to do this career planning planning now. We'll, we'll talk about why. Uh, you know, I'll give you some prescriptions in just a moment. Now, third, the, the, the issue with uh, not having your career goals and not thinking through why MBA means that your reasons for applying the MBA are, are going to be weak, you know, generic, the sort of, you know, you guys are highly ranked, you guys have top professors, you guys, you know, um, have a great alumni network, those, those types of reasons that uh, adcoms hear all the time and, and then, you know, frankly add nothing to your application. So the, the, good, news, um, the good news is that the prescriptions for addressing uh, these weaknesses, weaknesses in these areas are, are pretty straightforward. That is, invest some time now career planning. You know, educate yourself on the value of the MBA. Research the schools. Uh, that's going to make you a stronger candidate uh, when it's time comes time to apply. Um, let's talk a little bit more about it. So, defining your goals. That's the first step, of course. Now, as I said, it's a time intensive process. Um, I will tell you that MBA prep school. You know, because every one of our it's kind of like taking the GMAT. Every one of our uh, clients, every every applicant has to go through this career planning process. We develop a course specifically dedicated to this, a step-by-step approach for formulating your career vision and mapping out your career action plan. Um, you know, in a sense, using this this time to supercharge your MBA application in that area. Once you've once you've got long-term career goals in focus, that means uh, you know you you've got some direction. You can you can educate yourself. On the industry you want to work on now, um, you know, if you write about in your admissions essays, uh, your application essays, you want to work in venture capital or sustainable energy or social enterprise. If if you uh, write about that, but your uh, your your career essay doesn't really ring true, it doesn't really seem like you know what you're talking about. Um, then admissions committees, uh, you know, they're going to they're going to wonder if those are authentic, if those are sincere. You know, they know that some people uh, sort of make up, you know, go- some 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 goals that sound sound interesting and uh, you know, but but really have no you know sort of no real interest or no real passion for that field. So, do your research is the bottom line. You know, find out who the market leaders are in, in that industry you you want to work in. Look for the opportunities, the issues, the trends. Right that the. the where, where leadership's needed because if you know that you're going to have a much more interesting essay and um, when you're when you're writing about an area that you're not about in an area where you know the opportunities are and, and when where you're really passionate about making a difference and an impact that always comes through in those uh, in, the, in those essays so uh, you know bottom line do your career planning and research and uh, you know that'll get you ready for your 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 career goals essay now Another step you can take is to seek out those mentors again. You know, not necessarily mentors at work this time because you're thinking about the future. So mentors in the industry uh, that you want to work in. Now, these guys are going to be guys and gals are going to be very helpful in helping you to refine your career path. Right? They're going to help you to, to to figure out what the best internship might be or what the best post MBA full time job might be. Right? And the more um, you know, the, the more well-defined and well-designed your career action plan is, the better that career goals essay is going to be, one, you know, once again. So, uh, so again, career goals uh, is, is, is probably an area of the MBA application that a lot of people stumble on. And if you spend the time now, uh, you're going to have all the building blocks you need to write an excellent career, uh, uh, career goals essay when it comes time. So let's, um, you know, let's talk about these, uh, let's just sort of sum it up here, and, and I'll turn it over to Chris because he's gonna he's gonna get even in, even more practical with you. He's gonna, we're gonna talk about how to supercharge every element of your MBA application, your essays, your resume, your interview. Just a minute, but but let me sum up here. So the, the ideas that we presented here today, um, you know, along the four talked about identifying weaknesses in four areas of your of your candidacy and and how. To so, you know, we started with improving your academic profile. You can do that through taking additional courses, but demonstra- demonstrating the, the skills or abilities that you might have performed well in, in college, at work, or in community service. 
That's the prescription there. We talked about accelerating your career progress. So, you know, that could include radical things like changing jobs or uh, less radical but equally important things like making the most of your current job. We talked about building your, your leadership profile, your leadership portfolio, we called it, adding to that by either making a, an impact at work or making a difference in community service. Finally, you know, I, sum, I, I ended the, the talk by talking about your career goals and, and doing the, the things you need to do now to, to design a great uh, career action plan. So increasing your knowledge, building relationships, helping, uh, you know, getting mentors that will help you to refine that career action plan. So, you know, in closing, I just want to encourage you to use this precious time now you know, before the application deadline dates to make your candidacy as strong as it can be. It's incredibly competitive, this process you're about to start. So that proactive steps you take now are going to, are going to, you know, are going to translate into a competitive advantage over the candidates who are just sort of praying that flaws in their application go unnoticed. Now, they're going to be sort of caught <laughs> trying to explain away the weaknesses, whereas if you've taken the steps we've talked about, you're going to be able to point to substantive ways that you've addressed any potential concerns up front. So uh, now I'll turn it uh, over uh, to Chris again. He's going to be talking about uh, supercharging all seven elements of your MBA application, um, 25 tips for building an outstanding application. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Thanks, Tyler. Today I'm going to share with you 25 tips for building an outstanding application. In our ebook, online courses, and private one on one coaching, we provide hundreds of tips, techniques, and exercises for building an outstanding MBA application. For this webinar, I've selected 25 of my favorite tips to share with you, covering all seven elements of a complete application. If you follow the best practices we recommend here, you will be well on your way to creating an application that will really impress admissions officers. So let's begin with an overview of the seven elements of an MBA application. Generally speaking, there are seven components in an MBA application. Your academic transcripts, test scores, a resume, the application form, essay questions, recommendation letters, and the all-important admissions interview. Let's start off with a few tips related to your academic transcripts. Regarding your university transcripts, my first piece of advice is that you should obtain a copy of your grade reports and review them carefully long before the admissions officers do. Don't rely on your memory because you might discover too late that that 3.2 GPA you remember earning was actually a 2.9 or that you repressed the memory of a fail in freshman psychology. But looking for skeletons in your academic closet isn't the only advantage of reviewing your transcripts. You want to review your academic history to identify ways to differentiate yourself from other candidates. So for example, if you excelled in a foreign language or you studied abroad in college, this might be something that you can emphasize in your application. If there are red flags in your academic history, the sooner you know about them, the better. Once you've identified them, you can then take steps to counterbalance poor performance with additional coursework or by tackling professional or personal projects that require the skills in question. And there are a number of ways you can mitigate weaknesses in your academic transcripts. For example, you could take a college level calculus course or you could take a business statistics class to help convince admissions officers that you now have the quantitative skills needed to excel in an MBA program. Finally, you may choose to address academic shortcomings in one of the optional essays. If you do, be sure to accept responsibility and avoid making any excuses. You'll want to provide convincing reasons that demonstrate that you now have the maturity, discipline and aptitude to excel in an MBA program. One sure way to offset poor academic performance is to earn a high score on the GMAT, which is the application element that we'll talk about next. Traditionally, the Graduate Management Admissions Test, or GMAT, was the only standardized test that business schools would consider. More recently, some schools have also started accepting the Graduate Record Examinations, or GRE. One thing worth noticing is that some applicants find that they score better on the GRE than the GMAT. If you fall into this camp and the schools you apply to are accepting the GRE, then consider sending those scores instead of your GMAT scores. In addition to the standardized tests, if English is not your native language and you did not go to an English-only university, 
you may be required to take the TOEFL test. TOEFL is short for Test of English as a Foreign Language. Even if you are completely fluent, be sure to find out the school's TOEFL policies to determine if you are required to take the test. Next, I recommend that you have the GMAT completed at least six months before it's time to assemble your applications. If you still have the GMAT test looming over you by the time you're trying to put your application together, you really aren't going to be a happy camper. It'll be hard to relax and do your best on the test when you know there isn't much time to retake it and your score might make you or break you. Finally, I'm often asked what score is needed to be competitive for a top tier school. And I think an easy way to remember the answer is our 380s rule. First, you want to score well above the low end of the range of scores provided by the middle 80% of the school's accepted applicants. Next, you need to have percentile scores on both the quant and verbal sections above 80%. Third, ideally you want to have a cumulative score above 680. In fact, the median score for most of the top 10 schools has climbed above the 700 mark. So the bar is even higher than 680 if you're thinking of applying to a top 5 or top 10 school. The next element that we'll talk about is your MBA application resume. Most schools will require you to submit a one to two page resume as part of your application package. My first tip is that there are important differences between an MBA application resume and an employment resume. First, you, your objective and your audience is completely different. For example, an employer might be interested in your technical skills, whereas an MBA admissions officer is going to be far more interested in significant achievements and in moments in your career that distinguish you from your peers, particularly if you're able to demonstrate leadership achievements. Your objective with your application resume is to showcase the qualities that a business school would be most interested in. These are things like leadership, teamwork, initiative, creativity, and management potential. Keep in mind that it is often common that your resume will be the only background an admissions interviewer might have about you, so you should ensure that it features the qualities that the schools value most. Next, think about your resume bullet points. These really need to be action-oriented, and just about every rough, rough draft resume I receive from clients need improvement in this area. Effective action verbs make a really big difference, so verbs like responsible for and participated in a flat and passive, whereas if you compare them with verbs like designed, initiated, and spearheaded, then you're going to achieve the desired effect. Another common weakness I see in application resumes is that they're missing results or the results aren't quantified. And let me give you an example to illustrate what I mean. Listen to the difference between these two bullet points. The first one would say, responsible for search engine or optimization. Compare that to the, a bullet point that would say, led a search engine optimization campaign that led to 50% revenue growth. Clearly, the second bullet point with quantified results is far more powerful and memorable. Next, let's talk about one of the most neglected elements in the MBA application, the actual application form itself. Most candidates don't devote enough time and attention to the application forms and data sheets. But these elements really are an important piece of your overall application story. And in fact, they're often the first thing that the reader of your application is going to see. So my first tip here is to take a look at the application forms from prior years for the schools on your shortlist. Sometimes programs will ask for summaries of international experiences or honors and awards, volunteer activities and hobbies. If you plan ahead, you can take proactive steps to ensure that when the time comes, you won't have blank spots in an important section of your application form. You want to really start working on your application form weeks before the deadlines. Candidates who wait until the last minute might be in for a rude awakening. For example, some programs require short answer questions such as, what was your most significant challenge in each job? Or describe your role in each extracurricular organization. As a practical matter, you also want to have time to carefully proof your application data sheets. Typos in these forms are easy to miss, especially because there's typically no spell checker available in these online applications. Cutting and pasting between application forms and from other sources such as your resume can save you time, but make sure you do so thoughtfully because sometimes an application form will ask for information that is not on your resume, such as a company description 
or a summary of your roles and responsibilities. Let's move on to the aspect of the application that most candidates are worried about, your application essays. You need to think about these application essays as an opportunity to communicate your strengths, tell your story and differentiate yourself from other candidates. A distinction that we make at MBA Prep School is between proving you qualify and proving you fit. The elements of the application we've talked about thus far, such as your transcripts and your test scores, will help the admissions committee determine if you're qualified for their school. But how do you prove you fit? The general qualities that top tier programs value are fairly, fairly well understood and intuitive. Leadership, teamwork, a global outlook, etc. But in addition to these generic qualities, schools tend to have certain qualities that they value more than others. We call these fit qualities. And you might consider these as the highest common denominators among students who are accepted. It's your job to identify what these fit qualities might be because a school isn't going to give you a definitive list. So how do you do this? You need to listen carefully whenever admissions officers, professors, alumni and current students are saying things like, intellectual vitality is really important at our school. Or, we're looking for students who possess drive and the ability to defend their beliefs. Signals like these are very important because they will help you to customize your resume, essays and interview answers to feature the qualities that a particular school values most. The approach that I recommend you take with your essays is to strategize first, outline second and then write third. And when it comes to story selection, the reality is that good execution on the right story is always going to be better than perfect execution on the wrong story. Formulating your essay strategy is about defining the central themes and messages and then letting your strategic goals direct your choices of essay topics and stories. Step two is to outline the essay ideas and stories on your shortlist and really choose the best of the best. If you follow these steps, you'll proceed to the writing stage with a clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish with each of the stories you're going to tell. The application essay questions will typically be published online three to four months before the first round deadline. However, often the questions don't change significantly from year to year, and the most commonly asked essay question is going to be some variation around, what are your career goals and how will our program help you achieve them? Other typical essay questions are going to include accomplishment essays, failure and mistake essays, and questions about how you can add to or enrich next year's class. I recommend you get a head start by drafting responses to those common essay questions long before the essays themselves are published. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the recommendation letters. And I tell my clients that when it comes to recommendation letters, a great process is what leads to a great outcome. Keep in mind that most of the schools are going to ask specific questions on the recommendation forms and expect those questions to be answered. So when it comes to choosing your recommenders, look at those questions and ask which of your potential references will be able to provide the most powerful answers. Your choice of recommenders really is critically important, and applicants sometimes make the mistake of thinking that they should choose the person with the loftiest title to write their reference letters. The reality is that a reference letter from an individual with a fancy title, but who doesn't know you well, will seriously undermine your MBA application. Our next tip is an important one to actually share with your references themselves, and that is that admissions committees want specific examples of your performance in the reference letters, not just a list of empty adjectives and platitudes. Even if your references claim you're in the top 10% of young professionals that he or she has ever worked with, an admissions committee isn't going to buy it unless the reference letter contains explicit evidence and examples to back up that high opinion that's being communicated about you. And choosing the right references is immensely important, but recognize that's just the beginning. Some candidates don't realize that you need to take a proactive approach to managing the entire reference letter process. A couple of weeks before the deadlines, they'll, they'll simply give the recommenders a link to the recommendation forms and then they'll just hope for the best. What you need to do is different. You are going to improve the quality of your recommendations immensely by supporting your recommenders every step of the way. If they're open to it, 
Give your references a sense about what kind of things you're hoping they'll write about in their letters. And one way you can do so delicately is to summarize the important themes that you plan to feature in your application and suggest a few examples that they might feature in their letters based on the work that you've done together. Next, let's talk about the all-important admissions interview. You should think about the admissions interview as being the final exam in the application process. Look, I recognize that when you're just getting started with your application prep, it might seem like admissions interviews are a long way off. You should be aware, however, that some schools such as Kellogg and Tuck interview all candidates, and often they'll conduct those interviews in advance of or just within a few weeks of the application deadlines. So if you're applying to a program that interviews all applications, you, your interview preparation needs to start early. Next, some schools offer an on-campus interview as an option, and clients will ask if they should take advantage of this. Look, all things being equal, traveling to campus to interview demonstrates enthusiasm and commitment to that specific school. Interviewing at that school can also be a chance to visit campus and learn more about the program if you haven't done so already. So choose to interview on campus if at all possible. One last thing to remember about the admissions interview is that like the essays, admissions committees use the interview to determine if you're a good fit for their school. So your goal should be to provide stories that feature the qualities that you believe the interviewers are looking for. This isn't about misrepresenting yourself, but it is common sense. You want to be selecting stories from your life and your experiences and your achievements that prove you fit. This brings us to the end of the seven application elements and to the last of our tips. Before I summarize all our tips, let me give you a special discount code only available to viewers of this GMAT Club webinar during the special 1 million posts promotion. 12 months of unlimited access to our complete MBA prep school virtual consultant program is normally $299, which itself is a great deal, significantly less than the cost of hiring a private consultant while giving you a step-by-step -step guide to building an outstanding application. However, during this GMAT Club 1 million post promotion, if you use the special code GC1M, you will save $150. So for a one-time payment of only $149, you will have 12 months of unlimited access to MBA Prep School's entire virtual consultant program. All our videos, all the tools, templates, examples, twice monthly coaching webinars, everything you need to build an outstanding application. You can learn more about this amazing offer by visiting mbaprepschool.com slash gmatclub. Again, the special code you want to use is GC1M. So once you're on the purchase page, enter that coupon, hit the apply coupon button, and you'll see the new price reflected at the top of the screen. Okay, so if you've been keeping track, you'll see that I actually gave you 27 tips this evening for building an outstanding application. I won't recap all of them now, but you can of course access this video and all of the slides as often as you'd like. At MBA Prep School, our goal is to help you optimize every element of your application and to earn an acceptance letter to your dream school. We hope you found this webinar helpful. Our complete MBA Prep Steps program will provide you with a step-by-step -step approach to building every element of an outstanding application. Best of luck with your applications and prepare to be accepted.